Hey friends, I hope you're well. Um, jumping in here to make a little announcement. Actually, it's kind of a big announcement for me at least. Uh, listen, after um, spending like a decade basically uh, doing this podcast, interviewing authors, musicians, leaders, I have finally written something of my own. I'm really excited about it. This has been a long time coming. Um, it's a long story, and I'll go into that story in detail at some later time. But today I'll just say my book is out. It was co authored with John Perkins. Many of you probably know who he is a uh, pastor, civil rights leader. He has an amazing story. If you haven't, uh, go out and grab his books, uh, especially the ones that are more of a, a memoir. Uh, Let Justice Roll Down is probably his first one, and then he's had some after that. They're phenomenal. I had the the supreme honor of co-writing this book with him. Um, it's called Go and Do, and you can check it out now. You can get it on Amazon or wherever books are sold, but I will tell you that you can get it for 40% off if you go to my website and go to the tab that says, what does it say? The tab that says discount code. Um, so if you go to shaneblackshire.com slash discount dash code, um, it will take you to a place where you can uh, put your email in, sign up, and you will automatically get an email with a coupon code for 40% off. So uh, definitely save that money and go purchase there. If not, like I said, you can, if you want to pay full price, uh, go to Amazon. I won't see any more of that money. So it's, it's fine with me either way. Uh, I'd rather you get the discount. Um, so please do that. Like I said, I will be sharing more about this book when the time comes, but for now it's out, uh, it's there. And I would be honored if you would read it. Okay. Here's the show. Hi, I'm Deb. This is Frankie V. I'm Grant. Hi, this is Bill. I'm Aaron. I'm Steven. Hi, I'm Joe. Hi, I'm Matt. We're Tim and Terry. I'm Susan. Hi, this is Phil. Seminary Dropout is supported by listeners like you and me. Seminary Dropout is supported by listeners like you and me. You should support the show like I did. It's easy. It's easy. Just visit supportseminarydropout.com. Just go to supportseminarydropout.com. And I'm your host, Shane Blackshear. Interviews with leading Christian authors, leaders, and thinkers. Let's go. Hey, friends. Well, today's episode of Seminary Dropout is going to be a little bit different. Um, a few months ago, my the church that I attend and I'm a part of the pastoral team, Austin Mustard Seed, here in Austin, Texas, began a women's book club in which they read together the just hit breakthrough book, The Making of Biblical Womanhood, How the Gospel Subjugation, no, I got that wrong, How the Subjugation of Women Became Gospel Truth by Beth Allison Barr. In all likelihood, you have heard a lot about this book and maybe even read it and have heard about or from the author, Beth Allison Barr. And so I uh, reached out to Beth and said, uh, hey, I would love to interview you on my podcast. And by the way, would you be willing to do it at the same time that my church's book club meets? And so the members of the book club could ask you questions. And she was so kind and accommodating. This took place like on a Wednesday night at like 8 p.m. after she had been at her own church. And it, you'll see, it's a lovely conversation. But uh, the because I'm not here in my kind of home studio with my equipment, the sound is a little bit different. It's well worth it. It's definitely listenable as far as the audio goes. And it just turned out to be such a wonderful interview. And the women in attendance at the book club asked their own questions. And I just love how it came out. So uh, without further ado, my guest, Beth Allison Barr, is professor of history and associate dean of the graduate school at Baylor University in Waco, Texas, where she specializes in medieval history, women's history, and church history. She's the president of the Conference on Faith and History and is a member of Christians for Biblical, Biblical Equality. Barr has written for Christianity Today, 
the Washington Post, and Religious Religion Ser- News Service, and is a regular contributor to The Anxious Bench, the popular Patheist website on Christian history. Well, cool. We're really excited to have you. So this book club has been meeting for how many weeks now? Um, seven. Seven weeks. Seven. Yeah. Oh, wow. Will next week be your last? Next week is our last. So next week is the last. Chapter eight? Yes. Chapter eight. Mm-hmm. Have so- y'all peeked ahead? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I was loving it. So I accidentally finished it. We were supposed to stay on track with each other. <laughs> yeah. And I finished today. So we're, I'm, I'm squared away. I'm ready. Good. So I thought I would start with um, just having you tell some of your story, because that's kind of the backbone of the book is yeah. your, your personal story. So um, for, for those who don't know, what's the, what's the background of the book that brought this on? Yeah. Uh, well, the background of the book is I didn't really mean to write it. Uh, that's really the truth is was something that, um, came together in 2018 really was when the idea was first, um, pitched to me and the, and it was because of the circumstances in my life that I had been writing about on the anxious bench on the blog on Patheos. And that's really where the making of biblical womanhood was born. Um, and so in 2016, a few things happened, including my husband getting fired, um, at the church we had been at for, uh, 14 years and part, at, at the heart of it, was our growing concern about um, the church's stance on women in ministry. It wasn't the only thing that was going on, but it was it was at the heart of what was going on. And it was also the trigger for him getting firing, fired when we pushed to have a woman co-teach Sunday school, which seems so small. It was just so crazy to me now thinking about it. Um, but that was the trigger. And that happened at the same time that, um, you know, the same semester that Donald Trump got elected, which was uh, really a stunning thing. I'm not a real political person. I never really considered myself a very political person, but it was sort of stunning to have, um, you know, to have this with our church that had become so hardline about women in ministry that they wouldn't even let a woman co-teach Sunday school. Um, and then we elected a president who was outwardly misogynist. And not only that, that, you know, there was that live tape Um, in which he uh, made very inappropriate comments about a woman's body. And uh, it it was just those things just kind of hit at the same time. And then to hear my friends at church defending both of these things, defending that it was God's will for women not to be in these positions of leadership um, and for, you know, for uh, anyway, this, it hit me that something was deeply wrong in the evangelical world. And part of why I knew this was because of my background as a historian. And I had known for quite a long time that a lot of the things that we believed were biblical womanhood were actually um, born in culture. And I could trace it and I could show you where it came from. Um, and I could show how, you know, sort of modern biblical womanhood looked just like 19th century cult of domesticity. And I could show you where James Dobson was pulling from some of that 19th century stuff when they were writing, um, these modern, I mean, you can, you can go straight back to these 18th and 19th century texts that you see some of these folk pulling from for, you know, legitimizing, um, biblical womanhood. And so it was just sort of this mind boggling moment for me when I realized that things were so deeply wrong in the evangelical church that, um, they, that we would defend misogyny over the Bible. And so I just, in fact, I document the moment that, in, you know, my introduction tells when I, when I sort of everything kind of blew up for me when I realized I, I just couldn't, I couldn't stay silent any longer. Um, I didn't really know what I was going to do, but it was that moment that I began to write, um, you know, very cautiously at first 
uh, but getting bolder over time on the anxious bench, writing through why I thought evangelicals had gotten um, this stance on women wrong and that it was dangerous. Um, and so, and this eventually is, is what led uh, to Caitlin Beatty contacting me and asking me if I had thought about doing a book. And the rest, as they say, is history. Um, that was the beginning of it. So if that helps a little bit, I'm ha happy to answer any more questions, but that's kind of it in a nutshell. How brilliant is Caitlin for uh, spotting you and knowing? She is brilliant. I have learned yeah. that, you know, she is, um, she's, if she had stayed at Christianity Today, I just wonder how Christianity Today would be different. Um, if she had stayed there, you know, she was the youngest editor ever at Christianity Today, one of the first women. Um, and anyway, it's so I, I, I wonder what would have happened if she had stayed there, but she didn't. And I actually benefited from that because um, she left Christianity Today to become the acquisitions editor for Brazos. And I was actually I didn't know this at the time, but what, I was one of her first acquisitions. <laughs> so she was new to the game. She was one for one. Then. Yeah, she was new to new I, I to doing this. Her on, when she was still at CT, I interviewed her uh, years ago, and you could tell she's oh, really trajectory. Yeah. 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 So look, I'm I'm out of my element here because I'm usually doing this in my office in front of a microphone. I'm basically recording a Zoom meeting right now. Yeah. But one of the things that I thought would be cool would be for uh, these women in this book club to get to ask you questions directly. So sure. who wants to go first? <laughs> I have a question. Yes. So um, my background is that I come from a Mennonite family and mm -hmm. going to the Mennonite church. And of course, we had very traditional roles for men and women and expectations. Um, but as I've grown uh, as a Christian, I've kind of you know, come away from a lot of those things and left some of those things behind. Um, but one of the differences that I, I have noticed is uh, that my family holds a very literal interpretation of the Bible. And that is kind of the crux of a lot of issues and differences. Um, so I was curious to know, like, how your views and, like, as you came to these things, how that impacted your relationship with family and friends and um i don't know if you can share a little bit about that but also how to have those kind of discussions with family mm. ones that um, are hard to have Right. No, that's a good question. I'll tell you also that one of our graduate students at Baylor in the PhD program in the history department is a Mennonite pastor. Um, and she comes from a family that has supported, you know, the Mennonite tradition. Uh, so there, there is a Mennonite tradition that supports women in ministry that actually is very long standing. So um, that would be one thing that I think you could encourage your family with if you learn some of those stories. Um, she's actually written on the anxious bench for me, she did a guest post a while back on um, on one of the Mennonite women that she works on. So anyway, so I'll, I'll just throw that out to you. Um, actually, my family has not been difficult about this. <laughs> In fact, my family has been pretty much on board. Um, with it. Uh, my parents were involved in the same church that we were in. Um, and they too, in fact, the only reason they hung on for as long as we did was because we were still there. They would have left. They were already um, so tired of the trajectory that the church was going. Um, and even my husband's family, which, you know, his mom was, is probably is more conservative than, than my parents ever were. Um, but you know, one of the interesting things after she read the book, she reached out to me and she was like, she was like, you know what? She said, I didn't even know that these attitudes, that this is what some of these teachings were indicating about women because it never personally impacted her. And, and she was just really kind of um, struck by it and was really glad for the book. Um, and then my husband's sister is an ordained pastor. So, you know, so I think maybe um, my whole family, even though both sides, my husband's as well as mine, even though we were we were part of this evangelical world, this very conservative world, they kind of were already moving because our family is very grounded in the Bible. I mean, that's the thing that makes this so clear for me is that I have been so grounded in biblical teaching and um, the incongruity between how 
Jesus treats women and how God deals with women throughout the entire Bible and the teachings of biblical womanhood. Um, I mean, they are they are at cross purposes with each other. And this is one of the things, you know, for family members who, you know, who say they believe in a literal interpretation. Part of that is helping them to break down what do they mean by that? Um, and so, for example, like with my students um, who come from these very conservative backgrounds and maybe even, you know, believe that women can't can't preach um, or be leaders in the church, um, and they say it's because it's biblical. You know, my first thought is uh, like, well, let's go to Romans 16. Let's just go look. Let's go look and see what the Bible says. And going to Romans 16, I mean, it just completely opens so many people's eyes because if you go through that, I mean, I mean, one of the exercises I do with my students is I say, write down every woman's name in that text um, and tell me what she does. And, and we walk through it. And sometimes I have them write down the men's names too. And so they can see them side by side and see how women are referenced. And what they walk away from that is, is they're like, whoa, women are doing these things that men are doing. And I'm like, yeah, they are. And I'm like, so, you know, and none of the modern roles in the church today really correlate exactly with what was going on in the early church. I mean, people say, well, women can't be, be pastors. And I'm like, okay, well, show me that in the Bible. Show me that. Show me where it is about pastor. And they like, they try to do a thing like, oh, well, the priest, you know, the male body of the priest can't be. I'm like, okay, but the Jewish system, the whole purpose of the whole Jewish law and system was to show us that we can't get to God on our own. It's a broken system. It doesn't work. And I was like, so we're going to base our whole idea of um, leadership in the church based upon a system that God was showing us didn't work. You know, is that, is that really what we're going to do? And so then they start thinking and they're like, okay, well, you know, let's fast forward, you know, to the new Testament. And then they try to go to the Pauline texts of Tara and, you know, which are the household codes. And I'm like, okay, sure. But how do we interpret those? If we put them in the context of Romans 16, what does that mean? Um, and how, you know, what if we actually look at first Timothy two and three, and we realize that those male pronouns in first Timothy three aren't actually, they're not exclusively masculine. You know, that's something that we've added to the text. Um, so if we actually, you know, just get, you know, one of the first things early on with this, I got Scott McKnight to parse that whole thing to me. He like sent it. He like just, you know, he just does it. And he just sent me the whole thing and told me what every pronoun in there meant. It was just like, really, I was like, I wish I could do that. But anyway, he just sent the whole thing to me. I mean, it's just really, it's really striking. You, it just changes the whole nature of the text when you, so, so you're like, you believe in the literal interpretation of the Bible. Okay. Well, let's literally look at it. And literally women are serving as deacons. So we're, and deacons in the church, you know, that understanding of it is much broader than what we think about a deacon service today. Um, you know, think about Phoebe, you know, Phoebe's the deacon who carried Romans back to Rome, which meant that she preached it. That's what she did. She carried it and she preached it. Um, and so Phoebe was the first preacher of the most important Pauline text. What, you know, so, I mean, I, I don't know, I could keep giving example after example, but I just, I just, I don't argue with people. I just say, well, let's look and see what you're talking about. Let's put that in the text and let's see, let's compare it in the text. I mean, I grew up with let scripture interpret scripture. That's what people, you know, that's what, um, literal interpretation, let scripture interpret scripture. So I'm like, okay, let's let scripture interpret scripture and let's put it in context there. And it often works. Um, you know, I gave a talk at a really conservative university not too long ago. And before I came, I got a heads up that there was a whole crowd of, um, young, um, reformed and restless, uh, men who were uh, sort of, um, organizing, to, to protest and be difficult during the talk. And I was like, that's fine. It's okay. I can handle that. And, but I did sort of rewrite my text, my, my paper, and I rewrote it around the story of Mary and Martha. And I rewrote it about what Martha was doing and looking at her in the Bible and taking her role and the role, you know, the words that are used to describe her and showing that she's being described as a deacon and she's being described in ministry, just like all of those men. 
And what I ended up with was a group of young men who were inspired to go and read their Bible more instead of getting argumentative, instead of anything. It was really, really amazing. And so, I mean, just let the Bible speaks for itself. Um, that usually, you know, people, the, unfortunately, we've been trained to only look at certain parts of the Bible and to not put it in a, in a it, not to link it all together. And when you put the Pauline passages in the context of the rest of the Bible, they don't look the same. So is that helpful? Yeah, definitely. I appreciate that. Thank you. You know, Beth, one of the things that you're touching on was something I really appreciated in the book, which was, you know, questions that a lot of, I think a lot of young people are wrestling with and churches are wrestling with is just in general, how do we read the Bible? Mm-hmm. Like what's the, what's the hermeneutic that we use to read the yeah. Bible and, and can it be authoritative, you know, forget inspiration. Can it be, can it be authoritative? And I, I feel like before we even ask those questions, we have to learn to deal with the Bible on its own terms and not through like the baggage of the culture that we bring to it before we can even say like, do what, how do I want this to affect my life? You know, we have to understand what we carry to the text. And that's actually a really hard thing. You know, I think, I think that was a lot because I'm, because I'm a historian, uh, I mean, this is, you know, this is the basic methodology of being, of being a historian is that when, and I'm, I'm trained in social and cultural history. Um, and so one part of my background is that historians never approach texts as neutral parties. Um, we always carry things to the text. And so for us to understand the texts, we have to not only put it the text within its own context, but we have to understand why we are looking at it a particular way. And it does not mean that you can't glean truth from texts. It just means that you you can get a better shot at getting truth from texts if you understand what you're bringing to it and if you understand the appropriate context of the text. Um, and so I think, you know, and that really is how we need to learn to approach the Bible. Um, you know, the Bible was written in a world that wasn't like ours. And one of the things we've done with the English Bible is we have made it look, we have made the Bible maybe approachable in ways that doesn't always do us a service um, because it makes us think that we understand it in ways that we really don't um, because we don't struggle with it as much. Um, You know, I think about the message, people ask me about the message and I'm like, you know, on the one hand, the message isn't a translation. It's a, you know, it's a paraphrase. Um, There's lots of really good things about the message. You know, it reaches people who otherwise maybe wouldn't make it through biblical text. But at the same time, what we have to realize is that by making the message so comfortable, it really is glossing over um, some significant context of the Bible that if you really are going to grapple and understand and go beyond sort of basic evangelism, you need to understand that the Bible was written in a world that wasn't like ours. And, um, and I think that's something that, you know, I think maybe it's in our, our, um, our early American DNA that um, we can do this on our own, that we don't have to have an authority step in and help us with it. And I do believe there is truth in that. But at the same time, I also believe that um, that understanding the Bible on our own doesn't mean that we don't use resources to help ourselves and that we don't realize that we don't know everything and that we do have to lean on other um, other interpretations, how other people have looked at it, and especially think about why we are attracted to certain texts, um, because a lot of that has to do with culture. Um, so, you know, I mean, one of the early on when I was doing things with this, I had a blog post on um, the top 10 Bible verses in medieval England, and where I kind of went through all of the sermons that I studied and pulled out the most most quoted scripture passages, and they are very different scriptures than what we focus on today. And and that is because it's not that those scriptures are more or less important. It's just that their world was so different that they, things were, they, things, different things were important to them. And so we have to think about that, you know, with us today. So I don't know, I'm sort of rambling, but 
I'm, no, that's, that's the end of the day. <laughs> that's good. I have some thoughts, but who else wants to ask a question? I have a quick question. Maybe this is a little, a little lighthearted. <laughs> Hi, sure. Yeah. Um, I just want to say thank you also. Your book was really helpful for me. Um, it introduced things that I've been in church my whole life. And I was like, no one ever told me this before. Or, you know, this was never presented to me. I went to a Christian college and I was like, well, this is, this is mind blowing. <laughs> um, yeah. and, and really appreciate the, cause I, I think that for a lot of my, um, you know, faith experience has been like, well, I guess I'm just kind of a bad Christian cause I don't really want to subscribe to some of this stuff, you know, or right. I, I was accused of ter- cherry picking or whatever. And it's like, yeah, well, sure. But, um, sorry. Like, <laughs> um, so, so I appreciate just the, the, scholarship behind um your book and just kind of you know the the research and everything that that was involved with it to to bring well, thank you that I had never I had never had before um so thank you but yeah, thank um, you. you mentioned something in the book which I think is is a common um kind of fear really uh, of like a, a slippery slope of mm-hmm. like well if this one thing is not true then none of this can be true you know and in your experience as a professor, has that happened? Like, <laughs> uh, I mean, I'm sure, I'm sure there's been, you know, maybe some digging of the heels deeper or something on the other side, or, or maybe some enlightenment yeah. considering of, you know, maybe the, I'm coming at this the wrong way, but it, you know, with your experience with students coming in thinking a certain way and then, you know, having yeah. lessons, um, showing them something else, has that been, has that um, <laughs> It is. Now, I mean, what's interesting about slippery slope mentality is that has a history too. And in modern evangelicalism, I mean, that was really born at the early part of the 20th century in the fundamentalist modernist controversy. And um, and so, I mean, it was, you know, this this great fight between liberal theologians who were influenced by German intellectualism who went too far, they went too far, but then the fundamentalists came and went too far the other way. Um, And so, and that's where we get this beginning of this kind of slippery slope argument um, that if you do not believe in this very particular interpretation of the Bible, I mean, that's what inerrancy is. It's not really about believing in the Bible. It's about believing a particular interpretation of the Bible that was put forward in the early 20th century during this fundamentalist modernist controversy. I mean, that's what inerrancy is. And um, and it's a very fragile interpretation of the Bible, because the problem is, is that if one part of it unravels, all of it unravels. So it is true for that particular understanding of the Bible, because, you know, really it started with, I mean, like I remember hearing this, um, that if you don't believe Genesis, you might as well throw the whole Bible out the door. And by believing Genesis, what they meant was seven day literal creationism. Mm -hmm. And so it was like, because if you don't buy that, then essentially it said nothing else in the Bible is true. And that is such a fragile faith and such a dangerous method message, especially since seven day creationism is so young theologically um, you know, this is not something that people ever ascribe to before. Uh, you know, again, it has a very clear history. Um, but the, but anyway, so this whole slippery slope mentality, I mean, part of when people ask me about the slippery slope, I'm like, well, who, who defines the slippery slope? Mm-hmm. Um, you know, that too is, is constructed, uh, but it is dangerous. And this is actually my husband and I in youth ministry. I mean, this is one of the things that we began very early on to try to help kids understand was that there were things that were central to the Christian faith. And really those things that are central to the Christian faith, I mean, they're summed up in the apostles creed, um, you know, these earliest creeds, you know, Athanasius's creed and the apostles creed, um, they pretty much sum up and those things haven't changed over time. You know, we believe in the birth, death, and resurrection of Jesus, and we believe in God, the creator, and we believe in the Holy Spirit and the triune God. I mean, you know, this is this is these early creeds. Um, and pretty much everything else in the Christian faith is um secondary issues. They're not, they're not gospel issues. Um, they're you know, they're not central to our faith. 
And um, so, you know, we would try to help. I remember, you know, my husband, he would always, when he would teach this, you know, he would draw like circles and he would be like, you know, this is it. This is what your faith is. And so you can like some of these other things and think you're right about some of these other things. But if you find out you're wrong, it doesn't hurt the center. No, really trying. And and one of the reasons we were so emphatic about that is because we watched kids lose their faith. We watched these kids who grew up in these very fundamentalist homes, seven-day literal creationism, go to college, find out that's an untenable belief and walk away. You know, I mean, very, I mean, that's exactly what we would see. And I would see that too in, in college. I mean, whenever those students are in my classroom, um, I, you can tell early on when they start having, you know, issues and concerns, and I'm always very concerned about them because their faith is fragile. And, um, you know, on the one hand, while I think it's important to deconstruct things that aren't part of our faith so that our faith can be stronger, I think it's really important to not deconstruct people where they can't reconstruct. Mm -hmm. And that's what happens to a lot of people is that, you know, the pieces fall apart and they can't, they can't put them back together. And so as a professor, I try to be really attentive to that. And one of the ways I do it is, you know, when I used to teach some of these things in in freshman classes, you know, I would say, I would tell them, I would say there, I have been teaching and studying manuscripts my entire, you know, adult life. And I have never seen anything that has shaken my faith in, um, in what I believe um, about, about salvation and Christianity. And so sometimes I would just be, and so they would know that with me up front. And so when anything got kind of scary in class, they would be like, oh, but this, you, this doesn't scare you. And I'd be like, no, this doesn't scare me. This is why it doesn't scare me. And so putting that up front would often help. Um, So that's one of the methods, but yeah, I'm very sensitive to that because I see it happen all the time. And if you think about this whole deconstruction and ex-evangelical, I've had lots of conversations with some of these ex-evangelicals and, um, you know, and mostly, in fact, I've told more than one of them. I'm like, I wish you were in my youth group. (laughs) You know, I wish you had been in our youth group Um, because maybe, maybe we could have helped you not walk away. So So, um, my understanding from the book is that, um, medieval Christians kind of had this theology that women could participate in certain ministries, um, if they, um, basically reached some kind of higher plane where they became males, basically. Yeah, essentially. Yep. (laughs) So, so obviously... That, that's messed up, you know. That's messed uh, up too. It's exactly yeah, right. Right. But it did, it made a pathway for it women did. to participate in ministry in the church. That's exactly right. I'm glad you got that. You know, some people have walked away from the book being like, oh, well, the Reformation just destroyed everything for women. I'm like, no, <laughs> that's not what I'm arguing. Um, patriarchy just changed, you know, this dust and that's what happened. So. So, so talk about a little bit about what those kind of offices were, those ways that women could participate uh, in. Yeah. The well, one of the differences in the medieval world, um, the marriage role was not considered sacrosanct within within Christianity. That wasn't really the heart of the Christian faith, whereas today in evangelicalism, you know, it's the home, it's the, it's that nuclear family, um, that is really considered to be the heart of the faith. And so you think about all this stuff, like even James Dobson focus on the family. I mean, the whole thing was, if you get the family, right, then you will get the faith, right. And then you will get the Christian nation, right. Um, which is like, so Roman, Um, you know, pagan first century Rome, that's exactly what they were doing. It's also what Hitler was doing, by the way. Anyway, but um, there we are. So it's uh, the medieval world didn't put that type of, um, you know, didn't sanctify marriage in that same way. Um, You know, the best thing a person could be in the medieval world, the godliest a person could be was completely dedicated to God and having given up um, given up the, you know, the, the flesh given up sex. And so the, um, so men, celibate men who had given up marriage 
and had dedicated themselves to serving God and celibate women who had done the same sort of thing, either as um, all of their life or had um, after a spouse had died, they had dedicated themselves, um, you know, as widows. And so those were considered to be the, the godliest people, the people who are closest to God. And it was those people, you know, in the, in the medieval Catholic church, um, only those people who had forsaken the marriage life, married life after the 11th and 12th centuries, you know, this has a history too. And it's in the 11th and 12th centuries that this really theology really starts formulating, but though only only people who weren't married could take the major orders, um, which means they could be ordained. And so only, only people who had given up um, marriage, only men who had given up marriage could do that. Um, women technically couldn't be ordained, although we have stories about women in the early church who ordained. I tell one of them, Bridget of Kildare, um, who gets accidentally ordained, and it's actually really funny. Um, but there are there are other women who seem to have been ordained in the early medieval world um, when the boundaries were not quite as firm. And there were also, and we also know that women in the early church clearly were functioning and, and performing the sacraments. It's not really until the fifth and the sixth centuries that we start getting um, rules against women performing the sacraments. Um, so anyway, but women who dedicated themselves to God, especially holy women, women who you know lived in monasteries and gained reputations of sanctity, um, they could teach men and they could preach. And we see, uh, we have a lot of these women who actually um, became famous for preaching and teaching and even traveling throughout Europe. You know, Hildegard of Bingen is a very famous one who went on all these preaching tours um, throughout Europe, teaching the Pope and, you know, teaching, teaching the bishops, et cetera. And so women technically didn't hold the offices that we think about of the medieval church, like, you know, priest, um, even, you know, deacon, uh, priest. Um, bishop, et cetera, but they held these roles that often correlated with those roles, like the role of abbess, um, actually, you know, often sometimes um, had as much authority of the role as the role of bishop. And so we have these really powerful abbesses um, who sometimes in the early medieval world even ruled um, male monasteries too. They had power over the men in the male monasteries. Um, we also see some of these women who get reputations as um, being mystics and being people who God spoke directly to. Um, and they gain authority uh, as preachers and actually, you know, are able to preach and to teach um, not just women, but also men. So even though women don't carry the titles, they still do the work. And I mean, this is the same as today. Um, but in the medieval world, they were recognized as also being of um, sanctified status. And um, and so which and they were uh they were also allowed, um, you know, to hold these types of positions, which is something after the Reformation, um, when women's godliness became tied up with being married and being married in the early modern world meant being under the authority, under the legal authority of a husband, those options then begin to disappear uh, for Protestant women. So is that helpful a little bit? Let's try yeah. not to know too many. I could tell a lot of, a lot of stories about women, but <laughs> people just have to read the book. Um, yeah. Well, I have even more, but you know, there we are. Okay. Part I, two then. Um, no, I think that's really helpful because I think what we see there is that uh, that shows that the really strict emphasis on marriage and mm -hmm. women becoming wives and yeah. Uh, not working and, and being a part of the cult of domesticity, as you call it. Yeah. Um, those are like recent inventions. Very, re especially women not working. I mean, the history of women and work is so long. I mean, that's actually one of the craziest things, this, this idea that the, the proper, you know, the godliest woman is a woman who stays home and takes care of her family. That was not possible before the, really the modern world. I mean, that just, it was only possible for rich people and rich women in the medieval world 
um, didn't care for their children in those same ways. I mean, you know, we, in fact, there used to be in the 19th century, there were scholars who said that women and that women must have not loved their children as much in the medieval world as modern women do, um, because they didn't like, they didn't like spend all day with them. They had, you know, other women <laughs> who helped take care of them and raise them. And, um, and, uh, you know, and it didn't have anything to do with these women not loving their children. It was just a different culture. And it was a different way of doing, you know, aristocratic women didn't breastfeed their children. And part of that was because they knew that breastfeeding kept them from having more children. And when your job is to produce as many heirs as possible, then they would, you know, send the infants out to a wet nurse so that these aristocratic women could have more children. And so that was sort of pragmatic and it was culturally driven and it had nothing to do with not loving your child. Um, so anyway, so those are, that is definitely, I think this, that's a very modern concept um, for women to dedicate everything to their children and to um, to their families and not supposed to be doing anything outside of that. I mean, that's that's such a modern Western elitist concept. And, and so that's kind of the thesis of the book is like this idea that uh, a biblical woman looks like this, you know, someone who stays home and right. doesn't teach men and so on and so forth. Um, yeah that we're not getting back to something old. We're inventing something new. New. That's exactly right. We are inventing something new. Um, and we're taking pieces of it from the past and weaving them together to try to make it look like things have always been this way. Um, and so that, which is what I was trying to do in the book was break down those pieces that we have latched onto and tried to weave together to say that women have always done this way, um, you know, been like this. So, so, I mean, in some ways, um, modern, uh, feminism, which everybody was reacting. I mean, that's really what biblical womanhood is a reaction to, uh, the feminist movement of the sixties and the seventies. Um, and so, but if you, you know, if you think about that, that was, um, rather than that feminist movement being something that was aberrant. Um, it is actually something that, you know, if we think about tracing, we can actually trace that back over time where women in, you know, all of these different time periods, you know, throughout history, we have women who, who reach, who look around them and say, women aren't being treated fairly. Um, you know, the church is not treating women the way that they should be treating. And, you know, Christine de Pizan, who I talk about in the book is one of these women who looks around her and says, this is not the way women are supposed to be treated. This is not the way God treats women. Um, and so, you know, it's interesting that we have this continuity of women's voices um, speaking up for other women and speaking up that God calls them to um, in pretty much the same ways as men. So if you want biblical womanhood, there you are. There you go. Okay. <laughs> I'm stuck in a blanket. Yeah, it's a um, okay, so my question is, like, I'm married, and I have a very supportive husband. I work in a male-dominated field. Like, all these, I grew up mm -hmm. in a household with a mother who worked and a grandmother who worked and owned her own. Right. But, like, I have lots of examples of that in my life, and I think as a result, chose a spouse who feels similarly. But when I talk about things like the patriarchy or biblical womanhood, mm -hmm. I just, and it, not just with him, but of other men of like mind, there's like shame associated to it, right? Like they, yeah. they feel that it's accusatory and it's like, you have to be very careful because, you know, just like with racism, like there's a fragility to it when you like bring it to mind. And there is so, a fragility. Yeah. And so my question is like, do you have any tips on how to talk about it in a way that it won't be associate like taken in that manner and also like how is the best way that men especially can be allies in this and not just like I'm not trying to create a new feminist really movement. Room? <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. Like I, I, I'm not trying to create a feminist movement. I want like what are the daily things that we can do? Like what can they do in the church? What can they do at home, etc. to like slowly move the needle in the right direction, if that makes sense. Yeah. Um, you know, I mean, I see this sort of, uh, 
fragility is hard. Evangelicals are very fragile um, because so much of these things that we've added to our faith, we have made part of our identity. And so for men, we have put it into their identity that they are the ones who should be the breadwinners in the home. Um, we have shamed them for um, not making enough money for their wives to not have to work outside the home. Um, we have even, you know, we've even created this where they have to be these uh, strong, manly leaders. And we, we shame men who really aren't good leaders. I mean, I know a lot of men that aren't good leaders at all. Um, you know, I, I'm, I work in academia and there's a lot of, in general, there's a lot of professors that really shouldn't be leaders, you know? <laughs> I mean, we're really good teachers, but we're not really good um, in some other things. And so, uh, but we shame men because they have, you know, they've grown up with this promise keeper sort of thing that they are supposed to be the leaders of the home. And even think about the, you know, the song Courageous, um, you know, which I, every time I think about that, it always, you know, I like the song, but then I think about what it teaches men. And it teaches men that they have to be a certain way too. And if they're not that way, um, then they haven't, they're not, they're not godly enough and they're not leading their family in the right way. And it also tells men that if their wives um, are, you know, seeking like work outside the home or unhappy in the home um, or unhappy with their lot and child rearing, that it's because the men have failed to be good leaders. I mean, we shame men all the time. No wonder they feel like this. Um, biblical womanhood is not good for men uh, because it makes them be something that many of them aren't made to be, aren't wired to be. Um, I mean, I still, you know, my husband gets this all the time. You know, I hate it when people ask him questions, um, you know, they say like, oh, well, what's it like being in your wife's shadow? And I'm like, why would you even ask that question? That's like not a healthy question um, to ask. You know, they also used to ask him like, what, well, you know, um, how do you feel about your wife making more money than you do? And I still remember one time where he, he laughed. This was like early on when we were still in graduate school and somebody asked him, they were like, well, how are you going to feel about your wife making more money than you? And he was like, I can't wait till my wife makes more money than me. <laughs> he was like, you know, he's like, I'm really glad things aren't dependent upon me. And um, so, you know, I think, I think part of it with, with men and with our spouses, and I think about this with my son too, is helping them to realize that this isn't shaming them, that part of what has happened to women with biblical womanhood um, has also been negative for men. Um, it's put them in these positions that they were, many of them, you know, God never intended for them to be in. And so I think one of the things that, you know, I've tried to do in, uh, in my marriage with my husband and our, our, our marriage isn't perfect. Um, but it's, you know, it certainly seems to work pretty well. And one of the things that instead of trying to think about the things that I think he should do, I think about the things that, um, he does best and what are the areas that he, that he excels in and the things that he really loves doing. Um, and I'm not going to try to make him do other things, you know, things that he doesn't seem, even if they're things that our culture says you, you know, men should do that. I'm not going to automatically assign that as a role to him. And he, he does actually does the same for me. I mean, it's funny. Um, I actually am a good cook of some things, things I like to cook. Um, my husband's not a good cook. He's, you know, he, he's just not. And um, he does try, he, he can't fend for himself and feed the kids, but you know, it's not his forte, but he doesn't mind doing dishes. He doesn't mind doing laundry. I hate laundry. I hate dishes. So he does all that. Um, so I do the cooking, he does all the dishes, he does all the laundry. Um, when we had, we, we live on campus, so we don't have to do a yard anymore, but I loved yard work. Um, it was, you know, something that methodical mowing the lawn gave me peace of mind, helped me to think things out. You know, people ask me if I intentionally put that in my book about me mowing the lawn and my husband not. And I'm like, no, that's what we did. I always mowed the lawn, um, because I liked it and he hates it. Um, and he's allergic to grass. <laughs> So it would be kind of cruel for me to make him do that. Um, but anyway, it, it just, uh, so I think, I think some of it is thinking about the expectations that we have and realizing that our husbands, our spouse, you know, men are having to also deconstruct 
a box that they were put into. And, um, and so some of, you know, some of the things that I found to help defuse moments is just to ask why something upsets them or offends them or makes them uncomfortable. Um, you know, why does it make you uncomfortable to think about the word patriarchy? And one of the reasons it makes us uncomfortable is because we've been being told since the 1970s that it's a bad word. And we've been being told that feminism is anti-gospel since the 1970s. That's why we think it's bad. Um, and so sometimes just having that frank conversation and then, you know, asking, you know, like, what does it mean? What do you mean when you talk about patriarchy? And what you mean um, is that women are always put under, you know, authority of men. They're never allowed, uh, you know, they're, they're always put under that type of authority in some sense. And so even just talking about, you know, how that might play out. So I don't know. I mean, I think, I think helping not to place, if you want to deconstruct your own role and to be able to do what God has called you to do, we've got to let our spouses be called to do what God has called them to do too, and not try to make them fit a certain mold. It's very unfair of us to um, say, we don't want to fit a certain mold that women weren't made to be put in boxes and then put our husbands in boxes. And, and so I think that I try really to be sensitive about that. Um, you know, one of my rules of thumb is I, I don't ask my husband to do things that I can actually do for myself. Uh, actually, occasionally I do like, I hate putting air in my tires and I try really hard to get him to do that for me. Now I have a son. I can get my son to do that for me, but I'm totally upfront that this has nothing to do with me not being able to do it. I just hate it. And so I try to get them to go do it, um, for me, but you know, there's a few things like that. So I don't know, is that helpful at all? I think maybe just recognizing the fragility and recognizing it's a real thing and being kind and gracious, um, and realizing that our husbands have been hurt in this too. Yeah, I think that's very helpful. Thank you. Can I can I read this great quote from Ben Witherington that you had in the book? I yes, I love you Ben know, Witherington. Or me for that matter. <laughs> um, I love. By the way, I love Ben Witherington so much. Yeah. EW three econ. Uh, no, no. The problem in the church is not strong women, but rather weak men who feel threatened by strong women and have tried various means, even by dubious exegesis, to prevent them from exercising their gifts and graces in the church. Yep. That's exactly right. But, you know, we have to remember that those, those weak men who are threatened by women, it's because they have been taught to do that. Um, and so I try really hard to be you know, why do men respond this way? It's because we've taught them to respond this way. Um, and so, you know, there has to be re-education and grace on both sides. Um, when used to, when I heard women talking about like the guilt of like not living up to being like a Pinterest mom, you know, <laughs> Um, <laughs> like all of you, you don't cut your, your kids' sandwiches and star shapes and the dinosaurs, you know, and yeah. That, and the dinosaurs yeah, and stuff. Yeah. yeah. Well, I, my response for a long time was like, well, okay. But like, why do you care? Like why feel that pressure? And, and I realized they felt that pressure because society told them to feel that pressure. And it sounds like that's what you're saying about men is like society also tells us to feel a certain way, yeah, whether we want to or not. Yep. Our churches tell, I mean, you know, I've had conversations with women who are like, you know, I really feel led to lead this Bible study, but my husband won't do it with me. And I'm like, well, maybe your husband's not led <laughs> to lead it. <laughs> why, if you feel led, why don't you do it? You know, I mean, it's like, why are we trying to make our husbands do things just because we think they should do them? Um, so I always try to think about why, why am I putting those pressures on my spouse? Um, you know, I don't always, I, I'm not perfect either. I, I, I put expectations on, and sometimes he calls me on He's like, well, why are you, you know, why are you putting that on me? And I'm like, oh, you know, you're right about that. So. Questions? Erin? Yeah. Um, I really appreciate you sharing your story about um, the catalysts for you writing this book and mm -hmm. two of them and both very vulnerable and, and incredibly painful. And so I appreciate you sharing that. Um, I could relate to some of the 
Hmm. The church hurt. Um, yeah. And I know several friends who could as well. And I feel like you were telling so uh, the story of one of our, our best friends, you know, you went out oh. to the youth ministry and also challenging um, the role of women. And um, so anyway, but I'm sorry. Curious, um, yeah, thank you. Um, I'm curious. We've had a lot of conversation in our church community over the last four or five years about how to reconcile our relationship with the evangelical church that many of us left or that mm-hmm. many really have a hard time um, associating with or, or, or even embarrassed to say that that was our, the culture and that was what we grew up yeah. in. And, um, you have a lot of hurt. You have one son, is it? that I have a son and a daughter. Yeah. You have your children that had to leave a church community that they grew up in. Yes. Um, so I'm curious where you and your husband, well, what your journey of healing has been like since you guys have since you walked out that one day, mm-hmm. we're supposed to be greeting people, even though they let you go. <laughs> um, just crazy. Um, I'm curious what your journey has been like. If you'd want to share some of that doesn't necessarily have to, you know, um, right. be public, but, and where your kids are at um, with that and how you're able to have those conversations with them. And I'm sure they, I don't know exactly the timeline, but um, these are relationships. They just had to, Leave. Walk away from, wow. yeah, no, it was, it was hardest on my son. He was, um, 13. Um, when it happened, he just turned 13. He was looking forward to being in his dad's youth group when we had to tell him that that wasn't going to happen. That was really hard, really, really hard on him. Um, he of course knew it was most awkward for him. He knew parts of it. We tried to shelter him from, you know, some of it, we didn't shelter. We told him, we said, you know, that there were things we could no longer agree with at the church. And, um, he knew what some of them were. And so he knew, he knew parts of it. Um, now he knows the whole thing, but at the time, you know, we, we tried to only have him know what would help him and not the things that might you know, hurt him more, but it was really hard. I mean, a lot of the kids that were at that church also were at a school and he had to face them every day. Um, and so those were really challenging for him. Uh, our daughter was younger. She was only six and she actually really doesn't remember all that much anymore. Um, you know, she was sad about leaving her friends at the time, but, um, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't quite as traumatic for her. I think, um, you know, I think the change was hard and we ended up in a very, very small church and it doesn't at all provide the, because it's so small, it doesn't provide the, um, the social sort of supports that our church that was much larger did. It also doesn't have, um, the same, you know, type of teaching, uh, just because we're so small. I mean, it's just not able to do all of those things. Um, and so, you know, our husband, our son, my husband and I actually let our son, um, he goes to a, another church that has a larger youth group and he got plugged into it kind of early on because we thought that was really important for him. And so that's been really good for him. It was also good for him to have a youth ministry experience outside of us, which we actually were kind of glad about. Um, and, uh, so, you know, and my, our, our son's doing really well with it. He understands everything. And actually a lot of his friends, like, you know, half the, the parents at his school have all read my book, and, you know, so he ends up, he has, has conversations with some of his friends have read it. And so it actually, so his um, people in the church, his youth ministry, um, his youth minister has read it. And so, you know, so things like that, I think it's a little bit easier. Um, our daughter though, it was funny. We actually went out for pizza not too long ago. And I was featured in the local magazine in Waco, the Wacoan. And we were at a place that had it out. And it was the month that I was featured in it. And my daughter picked it up and was reading it. And she got like through the first couple of paragraphs of it. And she was like, that's why we left the church. (laughs) Right in the newspaper. <laughs> I was like, oh, I was like, you know, and she wasn't really upset. She was like, oh, that makes sense. <laughs> and then, you know, and, but she doesn't remember being in a church where women don't preach. Mm. 
She just doesn't remember that um, because we've always had women preachers at the church where we are now. And so, you know, there's things like that. She doesn't remember. And in fact, she read through the article and she said, mom, why were people so dramatic about women? <laughs> I mean, that's what she was just like, why are they so dramatic about it? She was like, women preach. And so, I mean, that's actually been really wonderful to me to see that with her, that, um, she has, she just doesn't have any memory of women not being allowed to do these things. And my son doesn't really, you know, either. And he has at our small church, his youth pastor is a woman. Um, and he has, you know, women all the time who are in spiritual leadership over him. And so, you know, it gives me hope because, um, it only took, you know, we can change this within just a couple of generations um, of, you know, children who just don't remember women not being allowed to use their gifts in churches. So that gives me a lot of hope. Um, as for our healing, my head, we're, we're Baptist. Um, we are at a very small, very different church. Um, one of the things I think that was helpful to us is we just needed something completely different. And we, you know, and for me, for a while I did have, you know, I, I sort of, I read Beth Moore in a sermon she gave not too long ago at Truett. She talked about how she had this um, sort of reaction where this nauseous reaction to people, evangelical people using certain words. And I kind of had that to the, um, to upper middle class white evangelical churches for a while uh, because it just seemed so, so fake to me and so many pro and I just, I just didn't want to have anything to do with that. Um, and so it's probably good. We ended up at a, at a very small church. That's very economically depressed, um, has very different, has a lot of challenges, but they are so different. And in fact, I remember when the, the New Yorker was down interviewing, you know, she interviewed my husband too, and we were at the church and we were talking through some of the challenges and she was like, well, how does this compare to what happened to y'all before? And both of us without even glancing, we were like, this is so much easier. We were like, you know, these, these, these are, these are challenges that are so much easier compared to what we had gone to through before. And I think we both kind of knew then that we were, we were okay. And, um, and part of it, I think that helped us be okay is that we never blamed God for what happened. Um, we always knew the problem was with people that it was people who had screwed up and, um, people, you know, and I don't know why evangelicals who, uh, believe in total depravity are surprised when people behave depravedly. And I mean, we shouldn't be surprised by sin because that's what we do. And so it, it, I think, I think that maybe being able to always separate and I never blamed God for it. Um, and in fact, I, everything I've only seen God's hand moving in this, I've only seen God's hand moving. And I mean, it hasn't always been easy. There's been parts, there's been days that have been really hard. Um, but I never, I never thought God had left us and I never gave up on, you know, I knew that the problem was, was with people. So I think that helped too. Is that maybe answer a little bit? Probably I talked too long. No, no. And I'm thinking about, I'm playing out the scenario of you, you know, again, having to shake hands at the end of your going away, you know, morning or whatever. And, and um, just thinking about, how incredibly bold you were to, to not put on the face, which a lot of women in the church put on the face. That's what we used to call, we, we used to serve yep. a and we'd call it putting on the face and faking it and all that. And you, you didn't. And so I was just kind of commending you. And no, I, I, I didn't, I didn't at all, <laughs> <laughs> which I'm not sure if, I'm not sure if that was always the, the best thing I maybe should have hid some of it. I don't know, but, um, but I had just reached the limit and, and the, also is I had put on the face for a long time. So it wasn't that I hadn't done that before. I mean, I had been doing that for years and I finally hit the limit where I was like, this is, and I think what it was is I was like, this is wrong. This is wrong. And I am not going to pretend it's right. And that was sort of my attitude. It's like, I'm not, you know, I'm not going to pretend that what the church is doing here is right. Um, and part of that wasn't just about me. It was because we, you know, we were responsible for these, these teenagers and these youth. And 
um, you know, we didn't want, we didn't want to lie to them um, too. And so that was, and that was one of the reasons why we didn't just walk away. They really wanted us just to disappear in the night. Um, and we, we refused to, we refused to let the kids think that we just abandoned them, So I'm curious, which is really what they wanted us to do. Did you get an opportunity to explain to the kids exactly what happened or did that happen in your book? No, no. Um, we were the night we were to tell them it was a horrible night. It was a horrible night. Um, the night we told them we were, uh, the, all of the elders, stood to make sure that we didn't say anything that they didn't want us to say. And so it was, you know, the whole thing. And in fact, um, our, we were told, and it was probably good because it kept us from speaking out in anger, me more so than my husband. Um, but we were, our severance was doled out to us so that, and it was doled out to us based on our good behavior. Those were the words that were told Thank us. Order. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, that's exactly what it was. And there were some days that I thought, I don't really want the money. I want to talk, but no, in fact, um, about three months ago, I met some of our former youth, um, at a coffee shop who they just finished reading the book and they, you know, what they were like, this makes so much sense. <laughs> they were so, um, so a lot of them just didn't know it until the book came out. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you for for sharing all that. Yeah. Um, Beth, you know, I was thinking like when someone uh, goes from being, uh, if they're, if they're strict uh, complementarian and they go to being egalitarian, that's obviously hugely liberating. Um, but there's also like a responsibility that goes with that. I mean, if you were like a strict complementarian who believes you can't work outside the house um, and then you become egalitarian. It's like, I, and I don't think women have to work outside the house if they feel like their calling is, but I think that makes them at least equally responsible for, you know, the household, right? So there's, there's liberation and maybe these shouldn't be separated, but there's also responsibility, right? And part of the responsibility is the liberation and vice versa. And I'm wondering like what that looks like in the church as, as well, where, Maybe sometimes like we've tweaked our mental furniture to be right, but we don't have the templates. We didn't grow up with templates of seeing women serve. And so like, what's the responsibility well, that goes along? Yeah. With you know, that's, that's interesting to put it that way. Um, you know, and, and my, my kind of bottom line is um, I just don't think we should limit God. I think we should let God use people the way God has called people to be used. And so I don't care how they're called to be used. Um, you know, if it is in some women, you know, families, it works best to be stay at home moms, even homeschooling moms. And I'm like, that's fine. Just don't say that that's the godly way to do it. Um, that's what God, you know, that's how your family feels called to do it. Um, so I kind of also do that, you know, with leadership in the church. I mean, one of the big problems, and this is something I actually talked about with a pastor at a very large church. And he was like, you know, we keep trying to, um, get women to serve on things. And we keep asking them, you know, to do these and to serve on these committees. And they keep telling us no. And I'm like, well, have you asked yourself why they're telling, you no? I mean, you know, I mean, on the one hand you could say, oh, women just don't want to do this. And they just don't feel called to do that. Well, probably not ask them why they aren't wanting to do this. And what's really funny is he stopped like in the middle of the middle of the podcast and was like, we've never asked them why <laughs> he was like, we've never asked them why they didn't say yes to serving. And some of the things that, you know, what we find is that we have built structures in the church that exclude women and that make it much more difficult for women to be a part of it. Um, and, and so like, for example, I mean, if you're asking a woman to serve on a committee, that's only ever had men serve on it. And it meets at a time that men would always get together. I mean, it's meeting at seven o'clock at night. Um, and you're asking a woman who might have a full day job or other things, um, to come and sit in a room of all men who have never had a woman on the committee before during a time where she's usually at home having dinner with her kids, I would say no. You know, um, we've got to restructure some of the ways we do things to fit women's schedules 
and what women, you know, if you want women at the table, you have to, um, you're serious about putting women at the table, then you have to make the table be inviting for them. And, and so I think, you know, our mental furniture is we need to rethink how we, you know, the church modeled on the business model of the world, which is what we have done with the mega church and with, you know, our big wealthier churches. If we have modeled it after the business model, which is modeled on the lifestyle of men being outside the home working that excludes families. And so we have built churches on that model. And so we've got to rebuild the church. We've got to rethink those structures um, in the church. The other thing is, is that women are already doing a lot of this work in churches. We're just not giving them the title, you know, and, and that's it. I mean, just look, you know, women, many women are already the women who are running the kitchen service, um, who are called all sorts of different things. I mean, they're being deacons, call them a deacon, um, put them at the table with the deacons. And, and so some of it is just thinking where are women already doing these roles and then recognizing them for it. So does that help? Yeah. And I also see a role for men in there too, in that my wife needs to know that leaving the kids with me is okay. I'm not yep. babysitting. I'm just being a parent. That's and exactly right. Yeah. Um, although I can tell you too, as somebody who, you know, at the end of the day, uh, at the top, sometimes I don't really want to go do those things. I'm like, you know, if you want me to, why don't you ask me at a time like where I'm already out doing something where I don't have to get out and do something else? Um, so I think that's true. But no, you're right. It's also re educating, um, uh, you know, parental involvement that it takes two of us. I mean, you know, my husband's out there right now getting my kids in bed while I'm doing this. Um, and so it's just, it's doing that too, just, you know, that hour that we are both involved in this and we both have to do the things, um, so that we can use our gifts the way God has called us. April, you have any questions? Yeah. I mean, um, Shane already kind of asked a question I had, but I want to dovetail off that a little bit. Um, and also my oldest daughter is majoring in history. Um, oh. she's a sophomore, just a little bit down the road from you at Southwestern. Um, yeah. so yeah. So thanks for, thanks for, I know a lot of professors there, but you do. <laughs> yeah, I do. Giving me a picture of what, uh, sorts of things she could do someday with her life. But, um, yes. Yeah. But, um, yeah, sort of, sort of dovetail off what Shane already asked, um, Beyond the practical logistics of, you know, inviting women to the table, um, how do we, this kind of, you know, bounces off a couple of the other questions too. Like once you've deconstructed and reconstructed your ideas and thought about these logistics and, and ask the women why they say no, and part of the reason they say no is like probably some of what you've heard, um, you know, Forbes and and um, some, um, Harvard, you know, have all been reporting how COVID has hit women harder than men. And yeah, that's exactly right. Women are just tired. Um, <laughs> yes. What would, you, what would you say to church leaders? How, like, like what, like what else? <laughs> Yeah. I this is what I'm asking. I mean, that's one of the things that we wrestle with a, a little bit at our, our small church um, is, is, is women saying no and, and, and asking why. And the reason often is just, I can't, like, I, like, I really can't do anything else. Um, mm -hmm. so we have a lot of men doing things and that's not how, what, how we want it to be. Um, so, one of the things is to ask the women what would be needed to take off their plate for them to be able to say yes to something in the church and letting, you know, what would it, what would they need to have help with or taken off? Um, and, you know, and it, it could be something as easy as figuring out, um, you know, childcare for, for whatever that evening or the teaching or whatever it is. And, um, and somebody solving all those logistic problems, you know, for women, um, and, and, and even their husbands, I mean, you know, uh, 
it's, it's hard to think about, especially when you have small kids, you know, to think about not only do you have to go somewhere at night, but you've got to get them to wherever the childcare is going to be taking place. You've got to figure out what food to take with them. You know, do you have to bring their pajamas or their diapers or whatever to put them in? I mean, all of those things. And they just all take mental space. I'm going to say, so the mental is what I'm saying. To yeah. Some of that mental load. Yeah. What, what can be done to reduce that mental load? Um, some of it is, is doing the preparation for them. Like if you're asking a woman to lead a Bible study and she's never led one before because she's never been allowed to, she may not have the tools to do it and she may not feel confident in doing it. And so, um, can you start off like, you know, if you want them to be involved in that type, you know, can you find studies that they can you know help, um, lead that doesn't require them to write all the lessons themselves and um, that allows them and maybe gives them some flexibility. Like maybe they don't want to do it all the time, but they'll do it with somebody else. And so they'll co-teach it. Um, and so, you know, what are some ways that can help make it not a burden, but help women realize that they can use that they may be called in some of these areas. Um, so I think that uh, some of it also is, you know, I mean, really just asking those questions, like what, if you were to do something in the church, what would you want to do? And just leave it open-ended instead of asking women to do specific things, ask them, you know, if they could do anything that really would be life giving to them in the church, what would it be? And just see what they come up with to see how they answer that question. Um, you know, like for me, it's life giving for me to teach Sunday school. I love teaching Sunday school. Um, it's not something that stresses me out. Um, so that's something that I love doing. Um, I also like being behind the scenes, helping do things. Um, but you know, I don't really, I don't really want to, I don't want to be the lead on the committee for some of these things. I do enough things where I'm in charge of stuff at church. I don't really want to be in charge. I mean, that's kind of the way. So I want to do behind the scenes things instead of being the one who's having to organize it all the time. So that was Pastor April. She does the the heavy lifting in Austin Mustard Seed. She preaches most of the time. And oh, that's lovely. Models women in ministry very well for us. So we're lucky to have her. Oh, good. Well, um, Beth, it has been so fun talking with you. This is a really cool flex for me to like bring you to our uh, women's uh, book club. So thank you for taking the time and yeah. thank you, thanks for the book. It was wonderful. Mm-hmm. Oh, well, thank you. Thank you for having me and letting me talk. I hope maybe I helped some. Yeah. So. Yeah. Thank you. I'll tell Absolutely. Her, tell her we're going to have a beer. We're going to, oh, uh, you tell her, cause you know more oh, than me. Yeah. So, so we brewed a, a biblical woman good beer. Did you? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, it'll be ready in about three weeks. Is that the one on Twitter? Was one of you the ones who put that on Twitter? I tweeted about it. So it'll, yeah. We'll be sure to, uh, we might, we're trying to figure out a way to get you a bottle. So, <laughs> you know what? I would be much more receptive of that. One time I taught a beer lecture because I teach about beer a long time ago and a group of undergraduate guys made me beer in their bathtub. And <laughs> oh, this will be so much better. And I, I turned down that beer. <laughs> oh, this will be, I still remember that it was better. <laughs> It'll be very sad. <laughs> it still makes me laugh. Yeah. It's a true story. <laughs> I, I made sure after that, when I taught my beer lecture, I took out the, um, I made it where it was much more difficult to follow the recipe so that maybe they wouldn't, maybe they wouldn't do that again. Yeah, good idea. Anyway, that's wonderful. Thank you. Thanks for joining me for another episode of Seminary Dropout. Remember, you can find all the show notes for this show and all shows at shaneblackshear.com. Oh, and hey, have you ever thought about starting your very own podcast? I bet you have. And I think you should do it. In fact, I've created a course just for you to teach you everything that I've learned over the last couple of years producing Seminary Dropout. So if you're interested in podcasting and want to learn how, go check out my course. You can go there by typing in podcastingforeveryone.org. And you can get a special discount by typing in the discount code SEMINARYDROPOUT, all one word. That'll give you 25% off. So go 
Check it out. If you have any questions, let me know. Okay. Thanks to those that left ratings and reviews on iTunes this week. Remember, that keeps the show front and center. Also, remember, you can find me on Twitter at at Beard on a Bike. That's at Beard on a Bike. Also, I'm on Facebook, facebook.com slash Shane Blackshear123. And remember that Seminary Dropout is listener supported. You can visit supportseminarydropout.com and press become a patron. Remember, this music you're listening to right now is by D.L. Rossi. You can find him online on iTunes and at dlrossi.com. All right. Thanks again for joining me for another episode of Seminary Dropout. Stay tuned for next week's episode. Love you. Take care. Yeah, my best. I owe.